Hello, welcome to the Coach Approach to Adaptive Leadership webinar series. Uh, today's session is a deep dive into the ladder of inference. Uh, this session is hosted by the PA Care Partnership and presented uh, through a collaboration with the PA Care Partnership and the Coach Approach Partners. Today's trainers are Doris Arena from the Office of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services, Alex Greenland from the Coach Approach Partners, and Mark Durgan from the PA Care Partnership. Today we're going to learn about the ladder of inference and how this idea of the ladder of inference affects our decisions, our relationships, and our interactions in our daily lives. Does anybody want to lead us off in a presence exercise? I'll do it. Well, thank you. Okay, so I want everybody to put your feet flat on the floor. Just relax your body as much as possible. Take a deep breath, hold it for four seconds. Exhale slowly. Take another deep breath, hold it for four seconds. Exhale slowly. Just stretch your neck, relax from your head down, get your shoulders, relax in your seat, relax your arms, your legs, just feel your feet grounded on the floor. Take one last breath. And welcome. Oh, thank you, Ann. So again, I'm going to put one more plug in for the um, Coach Approach discussion call. Um, just remember, it's a great way to kind of build and enhance your coaching skills, um, come up with different ideas, different ways that we might be able to use the coaching approach in this, this time of real uncertainty. So we do invite you um, to, to join us in that, um, that call. It's on April 1st at 1 o'clock. Um, and we have about an hour and a half scheduled for that. All right, so question time. Who in the room can remember a time when you made a decision based on a belief? And from that decision, you really learned that it was not true. So from the information that you had and, and that belief that you had, you made a decision or uh, made an action. And it turns out that the information you got wasn't true. Anybody? Come on. I'll go, Mark. It's Shannon. Thank you. And I'm so glad we're talking about this today because I can tell you that ladder of inference um, you really go up a couple notches when you can't see people and you don't, you're confused and uncertain. So I made this yesterday because my husband walked into my new, his old office, my new office and said, how can you work in this mess? And I said, it's not a mess to me. And so I said, why do you care? Like, <laughs> I was really worried because he made it me feel like the way I was interpreting and going up the ladder was that he thought I was being messy. And when I questioned him a little bit more and we talked about it, it was really, he felt bad that he was leaving the office in such a mess for me. So I was internalizing something the way he said it and not asking him more questions. I probably could have saved some discomfort between the two of us if I would have just asked a little bit, bit differently or used my coaching skills. And I didn't, I let that ladder go up and thought I was being messy and that wasn't the case at all. So there we go. Well, thank you. Mm-hmm. Does that kind of um, story ring true for other people, that idea that you just kind of, <clears throat> you make these assumptions, this belief in, I know this from my experience, that this is the way it's going to go, or this is the way it's going to be. And I, I know I, I, I do it all the time. Uh, I still do it all the time because we're, we're kind of built that way. And I think that's, we're going to go into that, that idea um, really about kind of what, 
the ladder of inferences and why we talk and why we think the way that we do, um, we want to start off with kind of getting us back into the recap of the, the coaching mindset is this way of bringing us back to remember kind of why we are here and, and why we are doing what we're doing. Um, to remember that we have this um, respect for each individual's own learning and development, their, their who-ness. And, and what we're thinking about that is that idea that we are all independent in our learning. We are all independent in our knowledge. We are all independent in our thought about how we understand the world around us. And because I see it one way does not mean the person next to me that sees the exact same picture sees it that same way. Um, that we, we meet the person where they are and support them in their growing. Um, if I put my expectations on somebody that they should be at this level and I haven't given them the information, the skills, the guidance to get to that level, but I just expect them to be there, is that fair for me? Is that fair for them? Um, and basically then our, our intention is to always help the person be stronger, be more independent and more and have more choices. Really when we think about the coach approach model is that when someone comes to us with that question that, that I don't know where to go, we believe in our heart of hearts that that person does know where to go, that they do know how and where they want to go. They just haven't always been given that authority, that autonomy, that ability um, to always re reference it and kind of get there. So that's where we as coaches need to take that step with them and ask those deeper questions, ask those thought provoking ideas that are not us guiding them, but are us being curious about what's happening to them so that they can really build themselves. Um, and then we're aware of our own bias um, and what we think about the person should do and, and how we hold those, those biases lightly. Um, many of us have had the training on um, unconscious bias and that, that belief that, or that, that knowledge that um, we're kind of ingrained with ideas and thoughts. And if we hold them so tight, those thoughts, and don't let things just happen and don't let those, those biases, those thoughts, those uh, ideas or thoughts that say, this is how it has to be, or this is how it's gonna be. If we hold them so tight, we can't help that other person. We can't see where that other person's coming from and we can't really grow ourselves. So we really have to hold a lot of those thoughts, those, those assumptions of where we are with people very lightly. Um, and then Alex, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat as we're kind of going through. Thank you, Alex. Um, so what I want to do is start to talk about, and this is a little bit newer um, idea that we're really trying to frame in, in the coach approach mindset. Um, this idea that when we think about coaching interactions and relationships, both peer to peer, supervisor to supervisee, supervisee to supervisor, um, boss to employee. What, what neuroscience tells us is that sometimes when we're having actions, some actions are truly unsafe. And this is the even wor worst part about it. Sometimes the inaction is, un is, e is even more unsafe. And, and what I mean by, by this kind of statement is what we're really kind of thinking about as we get into this whole idea of the neuroscience behind the coach approach and behind what we're doing is we want to have individuals that can feel safe and seen. Um, when we think about this, um, the idea of being safe and seen is the idea that we are being heard, that we have the ability to talk, the ability to be heard and the ability to have that person on the other end that's there to hear us um, and that we can feel comfortable in that, in that world. Um, when our brains are kind of not in that safe and seen modality, we're, 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 we are wired to automatically kind of come into that idea of threat. Um, 
where we don't feel safe. We don't feel that we have that voice. We have, we bring those assumptions back that can say, well, I'm not be, I'm not feeling safe because of X, Y, Z. It's all the assumptions that we might have. Some of it may be very valid. Some of it may not be. Um, when we think about the transverse of it, which is really this idea of safe and seen, you're then building this sense of control in the person that they're helping, I call it drive the bus sometimes, that they're helping guide the decision, they're helping guide things. Um, you're helping that person build that idea of certainty. They can know what the next step is. They can know how things can happen. They can know where their future lies to the best that we can provide them. And we may not know what the future is, but we should be able to at least kind of say, I don't know, but I'm gonna be here along the way with you. And we're also ultimately trying to improve that person's idea of fairness and really understanding that the situation that they're in is as fair as it can be. And we do that through talking, through communication. Um, one of the grounding and really fundamental ways, let me frame that back. Does anybody think about what's one of the best ways that we can be there with the person to have them initially feel safe and seen. Any thoughts on that? What, what's, the, what's the first thing that we can do to, to have a person feel safe and feel seen? Uh, I'm guessing express our interest or concern in uh, what's going on in their life or whatever problems they might be having. Absolutely, it's way. And and where are you to do that? You want to be uh, you want to be present, and you want to be focused on them. Absolutely, that idea of being present, that idea of being present, and being there with that person. That's why we, um, we that's why we really do encourage the use of the cameras, especially in this time of uncertainty and where we're we're losing connection. Is to have that idea of presence and to be there so that that person can feel safe and seen, both heard through their voice and through that that picture, that 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 interaction. Um, when the person is not there when they're not present. Think about the poor interaction skills that we did um, and, and how that made you feel. When we, when we, it was one of the first uh, experiences that you did in the coach approach um, about how you, really, you weren't there, you didn't feel well because the person wasn't listening to you, they weren't paying attention. That threat that you felt, even though it was a, um, a, a scenario in a way, it still was frustrating and angry at times. Um, the other thing is, is, and when we think about this idea of the safe and seen and, and really kind of where we're getting to is gets in, in re, re, when we're talking about this idea of the neurologic part of it, many of us have gone through some of the work in trauma. And when we think about the, the work in trauma and how the brain works, um, one of the things that we, want, that we have to remember is when we are fe not feeling safe and seen, loss of control, loss of certainty, our limbic system that rudimentary part of our brains takes over. And even if we know it's not a rational thought, we may jump to that irrational thought because of that threat, because of that idea of, I'm not feeling safe, I'm not feeling seen, I might jump into this kind of threat-based piece. Um, we're hardwired to do that. And that's where we as, as, as coaches, as, as support, as family, as bosses, as supervisors, as peers, that's where we really need to take that next step to make sure that the people that we are interacting with are feeling safe and seen. Um, when we think about this, I guess my question would be, what might be an experience where, when we'll say in a work environment, where you can think of where your threat radar went off where you where you either lost the sense of control lost the sense of certainty not feeling seen or heard or safe for that matter anybody have a, a, a brief example of that of where you might have that idea of of what a threat or or something that maybe happened um and kind of where how that made you feel like, what did you jump to? All right. 
Well, while we're thinking about that, I want to, I, I want to go into the ladder of inference. And maybe this will help frame that a little bit more. Um, so this was um, developed by Dr. Chris, and I butcher his last name, Aguirre's, um, from Harvard University. Um, and what it does, it really illustrates the process of how we make meaning and take action based on, and this is the key, incomplete data, incomplete information. So when we think about the ladder of inference, we are really starting there at the bottom. We're starting at the bottom to think of the world of observable external data, the stuff around us. Um, because the world has so much information, we naturally cannot take it all in. Is my audio bad or? Hmm. I can hear you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So we naturally can't take it all in. So we have to, our, our, our minds naturally filter things out. Um, and we decide what's important. Um, unconsciously, sometimes it's consciously. Um, we make judgments on the information that we have and that dictates and influences how we interpret that information or that situation. So when we think about this, we have the, the, the situation at hand. I filter this information to what is I believe what is familiar, what makes sense. Then this is the challenge when we talk about that ladder of inference. You can then automatically jump it. So there's steps when you talk about the ladder of inference is you add meaning, you add assumption, you add draw conclusions, you update your information as you get more information and then you take a step. But a lot of times when we talk about jumping this ladder of inference, you're taking the information that you have observable, you filtered it. Then you may take that information, add this meaning that is your personal bias and you're jumping all the way up to the action step. And when you're doing that, what you're doing is you're taking your beliefs and your assumptions to make a decision because you haven't gotten all of the information, you haven't clarified all of the information on what are some of the other challenges or issues that you might have there. Um, so when we think about this, um, we fill in the blanks in our heads. Um, we draw the conclusion based on this incomplete information, this incomplete data. Um, this especially happens when we feel threatened, judged, loss of control because it's that threat we're immediately jumping to that idea of oh i've got to make a change i've got to do this my boss just said i want to talk to you at three what does that mean what didn't i do why am i going to get in trouble um so when we think about this it's really this idea of kind of we're just jumping it and we're making all these assumptions and beliefs who remembers the monkey video Anybody? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Oh. Imagine what the monkey. Yes. Was, was it the basketball thinking. one? No, this is the monkey one with the monkey throwing the cucumber. Oh, okay. one monkey Never gets mind. The, grape, the other one gets the cucumber. We have too many monkey videos. There were the one with the basketballs and then the gorilla who walked through. That's, that's a secret. <laughs> uh, so recall that video. What was the monkey thinking <clears throat> while the other one was getting the cucumber? It's not fair. Not fair. All right. So I'm going to pass this on to Doris, and we're going to continue on to the ladder of inference. Thanks, Mark. As Mark said, the ladder of inference really starts with the as we receive data. And so the world has an infinite amount of data that can be processed at any given time. We're constantly being presented with data from all different kinds of sources, such as TV, radio, email, and multiple other sources. Even the room that you're in has an infinite amount, infinite amount of data. And so um, not all the data is important. We have to pick and choose what data we need in order to function. 
And our brains are wired in such a way that we choose what we need to function and filter out the rest. Otherwise, we'd go on overload. Um, or I've heard also coined as data smog or data asphyxiation. So an important example would be one such as the number of leaves on a tree may not be important, but the number of leaves paired together could mean poison ivy. <clears throat> so on to the next slide, um, our filters. We have different people are going to develop different filters over time based on any number of factors. Um, and we can be very attached to our filters. Um, filters are technically subjective and how we see or how we see has more impact than what we see. How we see the world is connected to who we are. So if we see the world in a wrong way, what we might say, what might that say about us? And that's a question I'm putting out to the group. If we see the world in a wrong way, what might that say about us? Doris, this is Ellen. What do you mean by a wrong, a wrong way? What, what does that mean? Um, say for example, um, maybe, you know, in the data that we get when we're, you know, going through our ladder of inference, um, if it's not the way that it was intended or, um, like a world event, if it wasn't, you know, perhaps, you know, our perspective or how we view it, if it wasn't the way that it was intended. I would say that we all have uh, implicit biases that either come from possible factual misunderstandings or more likely our own experiences, which aren't always universal. That's an excellent answer. That's Brandon? That's Brandon, yes. Hi, <laughs> excellent answer. And this is Anne. I just was going to add is that um, obviously right now we have a lot of those things going on where people have their filters on. And so, um, you know, it seems that uh, there's a perception of I'm right and you're wrong. And, you know, kind of the filter automatically takes us to that point. Um, and so, um, I, I mean, in terms of what does that say about us, I think that uh, a lot of people are kind of, there's a lot of overreaction in terms of not really looking at the data, you know, and, and ignoring it. And so, um, so anyway, that, I think it's, it's kind of, are we really, do we really want to know the answer? I guess is sort of my, um, my thought is um, that when, when we have our filters on and when they're working, do we really want to know what the, what the real answers are? sort of just kind of a thought I had. So. Oh, good, good. It's interesting. I, this is Mary Garrett. I've been, you know, as we've kind of gone through this, just thinking about where we are um, as people, individuals, and as a country, and really as a world right now um, with COVID-19. And so, you know, like when we're all more anxious and more afraid, then that ladder of inference happens more quickly um, because we're more, we can be more reactive. And you just think about things like, you know, young people on the beach or, you know, people's different views about what social distancing is um, and the way that we ascribe uh, beliefs or judgment, um, or we can, we are, you know, is is assumption making machines, we could do that. And so I think that um, our filters are even, you know, there's an, there's an opportunity for our filters to be more on in that way, uh, based on who we are and our identities. And, and then I think the other side of that is, um, we can view like, how are we all as a community and how are we all supporting one another? And that can kind of change that filter. It can kind of reset mm. it um, to think about it as we're all in this together. And then the way that that impacts, you know, all those assumptions and beliefs and gratitude and kind of our own resetting. So I, I, I think um, sometimes in 
periods of national crisis, we can actually switch that kind of to mm -hmm. see us all more together. So it's just, um, I don't know, this is so great. I'm, I'm really, and I love this slide about our filters. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I just was gonna kind of, uh, another thought that just came up is when Mark was talking about trauma, you know, one of the key things when we talk about being trauma informed is create safe environments. And right now, safety is such a huge um, thing that is, that is threatened um, in people. So I feel like collectively, we were more likely to you know, kind of jump that ladder of inference because of that safety threat. It's like a fight or flight um, mm -hmm. kind of thing. So just to connect with what Mark was saying earlier as well. Yeah, thank you so much for your comments. They're just so valuable um, with what's going on right now. I, I just appreciate them so much. So yes, our filters, I think Mary Garrett, you said our filters are a part of our identities. And not all fil filters are equal. Some are much more easily changed than others. <clears throat> so on to the next slide. Um, we take our filtered information and assign meaning and make assumptions to filling gaps in available da data. And I think this is um, the example that Mark shared a little earlier. For example, how many people can relate to this? My boss sent a short email asking to see me in her office as soon as I can. I must have done something wrong. The information is the boss sent a short email asking to see me. That's all it was. The meaning that I attribute to it is, oh, I must have done something wrong. And the assumption is I should be prepared to be reprimanded. So, I can relate to that. I've done that on several occasions. I mean, I just jump that ladder. Um, but this helps our ability to act quickly to respond to threats, and it happens very quickly. Does anybody else have any examples similar to this where they've received information or data and just jump the ladder to attribute meaning and then assuming that the worst was yet to come. Honestly, anytime someone says, Brandon, we need to talk, and then, you know, doesn't do it right then, but decides to set it out for an hour or two, I immediately go into what possibly could have gone wrong, because the, the need to talk is never a good thing. The I'd like to talk is fine, but yeah. No, thanks. Yeah. This is I Laura. Hi, one, Laura. The one time I it happens to me is when um, there's an email chain and my, you know, my supervisor CC'd, my supervisor CC'd, and then all of a sudden my supervisor jumps in, like halfway through, I go, uh-oh, what did I do wrong? Like, where did I misstep that they felt the need to jump in? Right. No, I share that. I, I've, I've had that happen as well. <clears throat> Anyone else have an example? Doris, I can share something that's actually okay. a really interesting um, experience. So part of this jumping, of course, like as Brandon said, has to do with experience. Mm -hmm. um, and the more experience you have, the more um, grounded in your rightness you become. So, um, what, I, what happened to me once I once got um, reprimanded uh, for a series of, of things I did from someone who was in more authority, so some, my director. And what I found was that every time I got an email from her, um, I started reading into it exactly what you're saying, that I must have, I must have done something wrong because I had that experience of once getting sort of a redirection or a reprimand, so to speak. And it's a lot of work, I mean, on our part to read between the lines of the new emails that come in and say, just because you were represent, reprimanded once doesn't mean you're gonna get reprimanded every time an email comes in, even though right. it's so easy to, to do, like as Brandon, as you were saying, I can so relate to that. Um, because it's um, it gets kind of locked in, and that right. 
really is is hard to break. No, yeah, I I agree. All right, and on to the next slide. Um, as Ellen just said, it, you know, you kind of have to be able to read into it, and we don't always necessarily do that. In looking at, um, you know, the at looking at neurobiology you have your um, frontal lobe and your amygdala. And so the frontal lobe is where all the reasoning, planning, movement, parts of speech, judgment, planning, rationalizing. And your um, amygdala is where your um, emotions come from. Um, and the amygdala activates faster than your frontal lobe, which explains why we fear faster than we think. So. Your frontal lobe starts developing after conception and reaches full development at about age 25. It's the last section of the brain to develop and it's late um, developing in teens. So that's likely, you know, where some of the risky behavior comes in on their part. Your amygdala is the region of the brain associated with emotional responses and memories, and it's fully developed at birth. So it's the part of the brain that's responsible for that flight or fight reaction and allows the human body to mobilize um, energy in order to respond and cope with threats to survival. So as Ellen said, I mean, we don't always have the, the luxury of being able to kind of um, read into things to kind of, you know, pick them apart and say, is this immediate, is this, is this an immediate threat or am I just perceiving it that way because our amygdala kicks in and it's that protective factor to um, guard us against any kind of threat to survival or threat to safety. So um, it's, it's an interesting um, you know, situation that occurs. And I know for myself, you know, sometimes I have to kind of take a step back and say, when I'm going through this, wait a minute, is this, you know, just the way you're perceiving it? Is there some reality to this? Um, and it really, you know, takes some getting a hold of um, by oneself to kind of slow down and, and think it through and look at how we're, you know, receiving the data that was presented and how we're perceiving it and responding to it. So based on that, I'm going to hand it over then to, um, nope, I have one more slide, I'm sorry. So um, drawing conclusions, updating beliefs, and taking action. Uh, with the story that we've created for ourselves, we draw conclusions and we update how we see the world and take action. For example, my boss sent me a short email asking to see me in her office as soon as I can I must have done something wrong. I must be bad because I'm being told I do bad things. I should probably do less since I'll probably just mess things up anyway. I'll try to avoid my boss until the end of the day to delay the conversation. So again, the ladder of inference helps us act quickly to protect ourselves from threats before we know if they're real or imagined. And I like to refer to this as the movies that we script or create for ourselves. We um, I have a way, or at least I do, I have a way of selecting the cast, selecting the setting, selecting the plot, and the ending before the movie even premieres. So I have it all laid out in my mind how things are going to happen based again on kind of jumping that ladder of inference before I have, you know, all the pieces in place and have had a chance to really kind of think things through. So I refer again to kind of creating my own movie. Is there anybody else that can relate to that? Or is it Shannon? I just like the way you describe that. Create, you know, coming up with the end of the movie before you even had a chance to watch it. It's <laughs> it makes a lot of sense to me. So thanks for using that example. Sure. I just have a quick example of that. Um, if, if, I don't know if you want one right now. But, no, no, great. Um, That's would be great. Just so my husband had a bad accident. Many of you know. Um, we went and saw the, the orthopedic doctor, and he freaked out. The doctor freaked out after he saw Mark's x-rays and um, saying, you know, we may, oh, we may have to go back and do more surgery. And, you know, and then he, he, he 
he left the room after he kind of shared this with us and we're both in there in shock and crying and had all kinds of things going through our heads like oh my gosh our life is over the way it is and you know so all kinds of things but you know once we actually took a breath and and stopped and thought a little bit more and, and actually he came back in and had more x-rays done we got to the point where we're like nope he's not going to need surgery he's going to be able to um, we're going to focus on physical therapy so that's our goal and focusing on that but you know again that immediate thing was you know partly because this expert this really um mm -hmm. highly recognized doctor was freaking out on us. <laughs> so that didn't help us so again it's kind of you know, I think a, a lot of it depends on who it is um, giving us, you know, if it's a boss, I think that the boss has greater impact or somebody that's maybe highly recognized, it seems to have greater impact. Whereas if it's just a colleague, it, you know, I think maybe it's the feeling of safety. So I don't know, just kind of a thought. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I definitely see that. Anyone else? Okay, with that, then I'm going to turn the next slide over to Alex. Thank you, Doris. Appreciate Thank it. You. So the, one of the big takeaways uh, that I think is important for us to talk about is that the ladder of inference is not something that we use as a response to being afraid or as a response to being in crisis, but this is just how we make meanings and how we exist in the world every day. So I'll give you an example. Um, First of all, I apologize that this, uh, this webinar is using uh, a traffic jam instead of you know, the complexity and the things that we have going on right now. But just imagine that you hear about the, the pandemic and the coronavirus for the first time and you think, wow, I really need more data. Well, if all you're looking for is data, then you might as well start counting the hairs in your nose, right? So it's not about data that's important, it's important data. So the filters that we have are important because there's so much, as George said, there's so much data that's available to us, wrinkles in our skin or hairs on our head, that if we're just looking for data, we wouldn't do anything, we wouldn't accomplish anything. So we need to be able to have these filters in order to act. Um, but the problem is, every time we make a choice or every time we look at data, we're missing out on how other people interpret the, either the same data or we're missing how um, you know, if we rush too much to judgment, what else could we be missing? So oftentimes it's not much, and sometimes you make informed choices, but I just want to put it out there that actually a lot of inference sort of helps us. Like maybe this week is not the best week to hug a stranger, even though statistically it might be fine. We just have, we filter, we make a decision, we draw a conclusion that um, it's not worth the risk. The benefit of that is, is far outweighed by um, the, the potential drawbacks at this time. So here's an example of just an everyday ladder of inference, which is the same process as talking to your boss, but it's something that people probably have experienced every day. So the filter data, it's raining, and it normally takes 20 minutes to get to work. So no matter what, it's raining, and you can say statistically it takes 20 minutes to work on average. Okay, the added meaning is raining makes the roads less clear and slippery. Now, that's a pretty good assumption, that's a pretty good uh, meaning making, but uh, it's possible that at this point, you know, it's already sort of set in and it's a bright day, um, but you can see how it's, it starts getting a little bit less and less away from data. Um, so the assumption is there's more likely to be traffic. So the conclusion is you should prepare for slower traffic. So then the action is you leave for work 15 minutes early. Now, is that going to get you into trouble? Is that going to cause a, a bad relationship? No, probably not. But this is a way that we as people take in information um, and take action and have to move on with our lives. So again, the takeaway is not so much never, ever, ever find yourself in the ladder of inference. The takeaway that I hope you come away with is we are always in some form or another in the ladder of inference. We are in it. They are in it. Um, and so what, what is there an opportunity for as a result? And we'll go into that. Okay, so when does the ladder get us into trouble? Okay, because we're inherently limited by our perspective, right? There's going to be that amount of data. There's going to be things that we say, oh, it's not important, but someone else is going to say, oh, actually it is important. 
and here's the impact that data might have that we've just missed either because uh, we weren't brought up that way to, to see that as important or because that has never been important in our lives before or any number of reasons. So we're inherently limited. Um, as Dora said, we react faster than we can respond. So sometimes we see a data, we see a piece of data, we can jump to a conclusion faster than just getting another piece of data or another thing that might inform uh, what would be a good part of our reaction. Also, um, and something we didn't mention before, the biggest thing about a ladder of inference in terms of a takeaway is it's a really good opportunity for presence to just notice ourselves when we're reacting and say, okay, I'm reacting. How can I, how can I adjust myself? And instead of react, how can I choose how to respond? And then what outcomes would be different as a result of just making that choice, okay? So we don't always examine our filters. We don't always examine how we're thinking and how we're making meaning uh, of our situations or, or of the data. Um, so just like Dora said about the movie, this will get us into trouble when we make decisions based on, that on those movies, right? Based on those stories instead of the truth. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so the, the so the tips for using it is first to be aware that we all are pretty much in it at, at some form or fashion all the time. And the people that we're working with, whether it's, uh, or, or living with, or, um, you know, the, the people in our lives, we're all um, interpreting data and using it in this way. So we're gonna look for conclusions and opinions, so our own and others. And instead of necessarily challenging, being curious, being empathetic. Oh, I can see how somebody reached that conclusion. I can see how they get there, but maybe there's something else to explore together, right? And just like ladder of inference, it goes back on you. Maybe because you think there's something worth exploring, that may or may not be true either. So you can check your own meaning making of, oh, maybe this wasn't a teachable moment. Oh, maybe this isn't a, a time to really explore meaning making. Maybe something else here is more important than that. Um, so looking for conclusions and opinions. Once you start looking, you're gonna find a whole lot of them. Um, when, and when talking with people, looking for data. Okay, what's the evidence? Can you give me an example? When has this been happened before? What have you tried before? Make explicit in the steps in your own reasoning. So my conclusion is this, here's the data. I'm in, I can interpret the data to say this. Um, and so based on that, this is where I'm going with that. Again, that can be so separate from yourself. So when someone says, and this is a little bit of an aside, so pardon me for this, but I think it's important. If someone says something and you come back to them or someone has told you you're wrong, that can feel like a real personal attack, right? If someone says you're wrong, because now it's less about your understanding or, or, or an assumption or data, it's about you. It's about us, us being wrong. So by making explicit steps in our reasoning and talking about our data, our conclusions, our assumptions, then if someone wants to challenge that, there's a little distance between you and your conclusion and your assumptions and your, uh, and your data. And that you may find that that gives you a, a much easier conversation than saying you're wrong. Well, okay, let's look at the data together and let's see what's going on here. Okay, here's an assumption that's being made. Well, what other assumptions could we make together out of this data? And changing conversations around a person and you and sort of two ideologies and breaking it down a little bit so you can uh, address things together. I hope that makes sense. And again, if you have any questions, um, we'll have time at the end, but feel free to throw them in chat. Um, asking others to be explicit in their reasoning, even when you agree with your conclusions. So the 80-20 rule, and this is another uh, thing that's important. Sometimes when we talk about methods in the coach approach, they seem to be used or, or thought to be used when addressing a problem or when facing complexity. But there's a lot in here that's great to do even when everything's going well. So if, if you agree with somebody's assessment and you say, okay, well, tell me how you got to that conclusion, you might get a lot of valuable information that you wouldn't have otherwise. Oh, well, what if, if they come to a, to um, the same conclusion using different data, then you might say, oh, wow, I wanna make sure that I look for this data going forward in the future as well. Um, so it can be very helpful 
for you and them. And the other thing that that does is when you ask someone to be explicit for their reasoning, if it's only when there's a challenging situation or only when you think that they're wrong and, and you're resisting a little bit, they're going to know by you asking that question that it's, it's to address resistance for an incoming way of trying to change them. Um, so if you're using any sort of methodology or you're asking people questions, they have to go both ways, both in the positive way and in the constructive way, because otherwise, if it's just part of a constructive or a disciplinary process, then people are going to be able to smell that from a mile away. That's going to erode trust and, and build resistance. Um, so the next part is being patient with others when they're up the ladder, offering presence to give them time to center and reset. Just like how I talked about earlier, ladder inference being an opportunity for us to notice, oh, I'm going real fast on this conclusion. I'm writing that movie. I'm seeing these stories. I've cast the characters. We're about to call action, but I can take a breath. I can center myself, relax my shoulders, put my feet on the floor, take five seconds or even longer. You know, and maybe, you know, when you have talk to somebody else, give them a chance to be like, okay, let's just breathe for a little bit. Let's take our time and then have a conversation. That can mean so much in terms of setting the table for what conversations you're having. Um, and then finally, as, as I've touched on a little bit before, holding our judgments lightly, both about uh, situations, about data, especially about people, about organizations, about ourselves. Allow yourself to be surprised. Allow yourself to be curious and investigate what else might be going on here. How might I be wrong? What other ways are there about thinking about these kinds of things? Even if, it's, even if you talk for an hour and you arrive at the same conclusion, you now know an hour's worth more about another person's meaning making and the way that they see the world. And I promise you that's gonna pay dividends if you have a longstanding relationship with them. That's gonna make future interactions go much better. Okay, so when we talk about applying this as a culture, and being mindful of the letter of inference as a model um, and taking it into uh, you know, your relationships. The first takeaway is keep an open mind, being aware of what assumptions that you're making, the positive and the negative assumptions, and just being open to other perspectives. We know how this can get us into trouble. So let's give ourselves the time um, to, to pursue what else might be going on. Um, celebrating when other people keep open minds. So celebrating that in spirit of inquiry and sharing not only your conclusions, but also how you got there. Appreciate others exposing you for different ways of thinking. So not just, so not just thanking them for their answers, but even how they're thinking is a contribution, that there's an, uh, there's an opportunity to celebrate. Um, receiving input from all people within the organization. As Ellen likes to talk about, leadership really does come from every chair. And there's leadership tasks that are doing, and then there's leadership as a form of being. And the coach approach is the same way. So um, when we model the coach approach, outside of just the conversations that we're having, if we're, we have an opportunity to take this approach in our daily relationships and to receive input from, from everybody and for us to see them as valuable. Um, roles and positions should not be barriers from expressing thoughts and ideas. Each person's perspective is important to consider before deciding on paths forward. Um, you know, as I said before, there's always gonna be more data you could collect and there's an opportunity to get more perspectives. Um, and then if, there are if you find that people are actually understand the model and use the model, you can start to use that in your conversations or I jump the ladder is a very easy way to say my bad. If you just, oh, I did that, it's okay, we all do that. That's not something, you know, that's not a thing that's unique to Alex or unique to Anne, this jumping up the ladder of inference. It's, it's something that we do by, by way of bringing that language into your organization or into your culture is an is a easy way to, um, you know, take responsibility and say, oh, it's my fault. And let's try to reset and, and get to the bottom of this. Okay. So now in the last couple minutes here, um, time to address questions. Um, so what questions do you have about the model? We put the model here but for each step. 
or how we use it. And then um, just a, a thinking about question, what can we do to use this model um, and take it forward in our work and in our lives? And maybe especially with the pandemic going on, um, maybe where are there opportunities to use this, to use it for the sake of empathy and curiosity? How, how do we imagine taking this, this model forward and, and what we've talked about on the webinar forward in your work and in your life? I think it's actually probably uh, especially important to uh, look at this model, to look at what facts you think you have, which uh, conclusions, what biases, but especially with all the bad information going around with, you know, hearing from social media or friends or people on the street, I heard this and I heard this and it's now safe to do this or it's no longer safe to do this. It's important to go back, check credible sources, get your stuff straight before you start taking unnecessary, either harmful action or just incredibly unnecessary energy and time wasting action in order to avoid something that you really don't need to be avoiding. Right. And Brandon, what's coming up for me when you say that is, I bet when people on our social media share these articles, we might draw conclusions about how we feel about these people. That as well. Mm -hmm. right? yes. We yep. might update our beliefs about the world based on who there's people. Now there's an opportunity to see them as frightened and, and scared and, and potentially be ep empathetic. I found and the uh, same thing in uh, real life where I live in uh, the city of Harrisburg and you know we're limited to interaction, but I take my dogs on walks down Front mm -hmm. Street you're not near anybody, but you have people screaming out, like, get back in the house. And I'm like, I, I know you think that I'm exposing everyone to danger, but we're allowed to be outside. We just shouldn't be near each other. So it's that sort of thing. They're thinking like, oh, this guy's, this, you know, an insane suicidal person. And I'm like, everything I've read has told me that we're not stuck inside houses. We may leave them. Right. So, but ladder of inference is on, is on all sides and it's, and it's ever present. So that's a really important takeaway. Um, thank you, Brandon. Other people, takeaways from the model or, or questions? I think it just gives us good questions to think about and to, to stop and, you know, for us to look at our own, you know, perceptions and, and thoughts as we go through this as well, you know, and just having conversations to kind of look at our own as well as using, asking questions for others. Um, I think just practicing using this process mm -hmm. so that we, everything that comes up, we kind of are more aware of it and use it intentionally, that that mm -hmm. is a way to help us and then um, that helps us with our coaching, so. Mm -hmm. And this is Doris. I just, I really like the fact, the word that you used, intentional. Mm -hmm. I really, it just hit a spot with me. I really like that. It is about, it is so much about being intentional. Mm -hmm. This is actually where your amygdala can be your friend. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. if you ever feel yourself getting reactive, that's mm -hmm. your amygdala talking to you. And the minute we, and this goes back to, and you're saying be intentional. When I feel that reactivity, I know I've got to pull in the ladder of inference because it's either that I selected data or that I'm holding onto my assumptions too tightly Mm -hmm. or something has to open up in order for mm -hmm. me to be able to be responsive more leaderly in my mm -hmm. relationship to whatever the the instance is like um my daughter is is about to give birth i'm in seattle right now everybody so i'm going to be waiting for this event so sometime uh -huh. in April. and i've had people call me and say giving birth in Seattle, she should go to Boise, Idaho, or, you know, go to Bozeman, Montana. And I'm like, you know, and I feel this, this energy around these assumptions that everybody has. And of course, Brandon, like what you're saying is like, everybody feels like they can share this with you. Um, yeah. But when I feel that reactivity, instead of using all that energy to be cranky or upset or worried or scared it's like i use the ladder to just sort of bring me down wow. you know what's really going on here you know um both from my own reaction and of course to the people around me so 
which put that out there for all of us who want to be more leaderly versus humanly. <laughs> this, is, this is kind of like a way to help us get out of our own way. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, um, I wanted, um, to, if there's any more questions, um, please let us know. Um, I did want to put a brief plug in that we are at four o'clock. Um, like I said, we are going to have that call on April 1st um, <clears throat> on the um, coach support discussion call information um, related around everything that's kind of happening around right now and how we can team up together and support each other so that we're not jumping the ladder. Um, we also have our next learning circle on April 24th of 2020 at 11 o'clock. And then we have our next webinar on June 25th of 2020. And that is um, Coach Approach, a deep dive into questions. Um, so um, everyone should have gotten an email from our uh, email listserv um, on Monday. Was it that sound again? <clears throat> so all the links are on there. And a uh, big thank you to uh, Doris Arena and... Uh, Alex Greenland for a present presentation today. Thanks, Mark, and thank, thank you, everybody. Uh, be safe, be well, and we'll see you next time.